Jesus and his disciples often ate meals together, just the 12 of them. But this night was different. The disciples were heartbroken when Jesus announced that one of them, his friends, would betray him. How could that be, they thought? Who would dare betray their own friend? Each of them questioned, is it me? Is it me? Desperately hoping it was not. As the disciples discussed this with each other, John leaned over to Jesus and asked quietly, who is it that will betray you, Rabbi? His answer was simple. The one who dips his bread into the bowl after I do. And that's when John saw it. A hand reached across the table and dipped into the bowl. The hand belonged to Judas Iscariot. He was secretly betraying Jesus. John's eyes caught Judas walking out, making no announcement as to where he was going, and no one else questioned his absence. Jesus asked Peter, James, and John to follow him to the Garden of Gethsemane, where they would keep watch as he went to pray. They had never seen Jesus like he was that night. His face was full of sorrow. His hands were shaking by his side. Sweat rolled down his forehead like drops of blood. Jesus was in anguish, knowing what was to come. He walked through the garden and eventually fell to the ground saying, Father, if it is possible, please take this cup from me. Jesus knew the gruesome death he had to die in order to save those he loved, and he was scared. Yet, at the end of his prayer, he took a deep breath and said, not my will, but yours be done. The footsteps of Roman soldiers were heard in the distance, being led by the betrayer. With great fear, Peter, James, and John watched as Judas greeted our Lord with a devious kiss, sealing the deal for soldiers to seize him. They violently grabbed his arms and took him away. And though Peter tried to stop them, it was Jesus who protested against his rescue. Jesus gave the soldiers permission to drag him away, throwing him into the hands of men who would decide his fate. The Roman soldiers viciously threw Jesus at the feet of Pilate, who interrogated him to see if he was truly guilty of a crime. However, he found no basis for a charge. He even tried many times to set Jesus free. But after the Jewish leaders argued with him, his last option was to turn the decision over to the people. And when he asked the crowd, what would they have him do with Jesus? They yelled out, in a unified voice. Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate pushed aside his own opinion and washed his hands of the situation, declaring that he was innocent of this man's blood. They tied Jesus to a post and whipped him mercilessly. His skin was torn and the pain that rushed through his body was surely unbearable. Yet he didn't open his mouth, nor did he protest. He took the punishment knowing that by his wounds, we would be healed. Blood and tears, how can it be there's a God there's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who reached for me. Hallelujah to the Son of Son. Your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing. Oh, praise. 
King Jesus, glory to God in heaven. Your blood still speak, your love still reaching. Oh, praise King Jesus, glory to God forever. Your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing. What they're singing about is so real to many of us in this room in overflow wherever you're watching around the world i was thinking about the price that he paid and how he bled from his body from seven different places and i felt like the lord spoke to me and gave me a little message to give you because every time he shed blood from some part of his body that blood heals a part of your life. The first time that Jesus shed his blood, he shed it in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was travailing and his sweat became like drops of blood. He 
refused his own will and he said, not my will, but thine be done. The first time that Jesus shed his blood, his blood was shed for the healing of your will. To make my will line up with his will. To make my desires in line with his desires. To make my wants come in line with his wants. He had to shed his blood. And when he cried, not my will, but thine be done, his sweat became drops of blood. Then the second time that Jesus bled, and this one's so important, he bled from his face when they tore his beard off. The text said that they literally ripped his beard off. If you can imagine such a thing, physically tore it off. His skin hung and he was unrecognizable. The second time that Jesus bled, he bled for the healing of your self-image, your image. And you may be here and you may be a young lady and you look in the mirror and you, you hate yourself. You hear a voice that says you're ugly, you're not pretty enough, you're not thin enough, you're not smart enough, you're not good enough. I heard that voice. It almost took my life. You may be looking at me right now and the image that God made you in is either male or female. But the enemy may be lying to you, telling you you're a man trapped in a woman's body or a woman trapped in a man's body. But the Bible said he made them in his image and he made them male and he made them female. And he loves you. And you are fearfully and wonderfully made, Psalms 139. And when Jesus bled from his face, he bled for the healing of our image. Third time that he bled, he bled from his head when they shoved the crown of thorns on his head. Bleeding from his head represents the healing of the mind. And in a generation after the pandemic that is broken, broken mentally, broken emotionally, Young people who've lost their way in the, 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 the depths of depression and darkness and suicidal and going deeper and deeper into addiction. He bled to heal mental illness. He bled to heal our minds. You don't have to live in fear. You don't have to live in a depressed, hopeless life. He can renew your mind. He can give you a mind that is thinking right and is, walk, is free from the, from the power of the past. And then when he bled, he bled from his back. Why? He bled for the healing of our bodies. And I boldly decree over this congregation today that by his stripes we are healed. That there's a name greater than cancer and there's a name greater than heart disease and kidney disease and lung disease. There is a name above every name that can be named and it is Jesus and by his stripes we are healed. With long life he satisfies us, hallelujah, and shows us his salvation. Then when he bled, he bled from his hands for the healing of our work. We think that what we do for a living is not spiritual, and we're so wrong. When Jesus drugged the cross, he drug it through the marketplace because he knew that was where people worked. He didn't just want crosses in the church. He wanted people to carry the cross through the secular marketplace. And he wants to use what you do for a living. He wants the work of your hands. When they drove the nails into his hands, he was bleeding for your work. It matters what you do. And he has a mission. He has an assignment. He has a plan. He bled from his feet to heal our walk. And don't you let anybody tell you you just can't live it. 
Don't you let anybody tell you you can't walk out of that addiction. Don't you let anybody tell you that you can't get beyond the past. You can't move beyond that abuse. You can't move beyond that bad relationship. You can't get beyond the grief of that loss of a son or a daughter. You can't walk out of that. He bled so that you could walk on top of water if you have to. Whatever's over your head is under his feet and he gives you the power to walk it out. And lastly, he bled from his side. You remember when they, that centurion guard stabbed him in the side and henceforth came blood and water? What was that about? My mind went to the story of Adam and how that he was lonely and God saw that he was alone, alone and God said it's not good for a man to be alone. He needs a wife. He needs a family. And God put him to sleep and opened up his side and reached in, pulled out a rib, and created a beautiful woman, woke Adam up from the anesthesia, and he looked and saw a beautiful, gorgeous woman. And he said, wow, man. And when he bled from his side, it was for the healing of our fellowship, the healing of our families, the healing of our marriages, the healing of our relationship with our children and our grandchildren. And there's nothing hell's done to your family that the blood of Jesus cannot restore. I want you to understand, he is not just the prince of peace. He's the prince of pieces. And sometimes all you have left is broken pieces. But he's the prince of those pieces. If you'll say yes to that blood, It'll cleanse your family. It'll cleanse you. It'll cleanse your will, your mind, your body. It'll heal your walk. It'll heal your work. It'll heal your image. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're in this room today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're at the unique transition and crossroad of life. God brought you to this church this morning not to hear a performance, but to absolutely encounter his nail-scarred hand reaching for you. And if you're in this room or you're in overflow or you're watching me anywhere all over the world and you feel something just saying, this is the day. This is the day. Don't run anymore. Don't, don't, don't back off anymore. Come home. Come home. Come home to Jesus. Come back to peace. He's, even if your life is in pieces, he can make a beautiful mosaic if you'll just give him a chance. Pastor, pray for me. I know that I'm not what I ought to be and where I ought to be, and I want to know that I'm saved, and I want to know that I have eternal life, and I want to know that, that I'm born again. Pray for me. If that's you, lift your hand high. Pastor, I need him. I need him. I need his forgiveness. That's it. Hands all over this room. All over this room. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. In the overflow. Everybody pray this prayer out loud quickly. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you bled and died and you rose from the dead. And because you live, I can face tomorrow. Because you live, my sins are gone and I have eternal life. And I am forgiven. The blood of Jesus has cleansed me from all my sins. Now we're going to have a triumphant and amazing ending in just one moment. But can we just sing this? Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that
Praise the Lord, Jesus is alive. Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? He paid the price. He died on the cross. He did it for you and for me. And if you prayed that prayer as you were watching this special edition of Kingdom Connection, I want to personally welcome you to the family of God. We would love to hear from you. It blesses us so much. That's why we're here, to hear from you to hear people call and say, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. It blesses us to know that this program has changed lives all over the world. And so there's a number on the screen that you can call or you can go to our website and we have amazing free resources like the 21 day devotional that will help you in the next steps for your new life and journey with Jesus Christ. Reach out and let us know what God has done in your life. And before I go, I want to simply say thank you to everyone who supports this ministry. As you know, the latest project is the Eshkel Resilience Center. It's where uh, we're creating a place to treat Jewish victims who are suffering from mental and psychological traumas due to the attacks on October the 7th from the Hamas terrorists. We know this community and we've partnered with them for years. Through our friends at the Jewish National Fund, we have built life-saving bomb shelters, a Kingdom Play School, a fire station with emergency fire trucks and equipment that was on the ground that without doubt saved lives all throughout that region. But more than the projects, we know that these people are in need and they need our help now to rebuild their lives, not only physically, but mentally and spiritually. Here's my announcer to share how you can be a part. Thank you. I'm standing here in the Zach's house, the Zach family house in Kibbutz Kisufim, the first community that we introduce you to. On October 7, this entire family perished. When we walked after the atrocities of October 7 into this house, we saw the father lying here behind me on the floor with a knife in his hand, and in the shelter behind me, the mother in bed, hugging her son, both dead and both burned alive. But just like this instinct of a family to protect each other, to save each other, this is what we feel with you. Pastor Jensen Franklin, and your entire congregation. It was an instinct, a family instinct, to come and stand with us and to remind us that we are not alone. You are responding immediately because you know us. You know us already for many years before. And you committed to build a resilience center that will give us therapy for our communities to heal together. In these atrocities, of October 7, we know that we will rebuild again. It will be painful and hard, but we know that with you, we can make it happen, step by step, together as a family. This program has been sponsored in part by friends and partners of Jensen Franklin Media Ministries. Your prayers and financial support make these programs possible.
For more information about this message and other ministry resources, visit us online at jensenfranklin.tv.